Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a given Wednesday afternoon, 5 o'clock block. Very important discussion on community matters today with Harvey Meyerson, who is a journalist and an historian, among other things, with tremendous credentials and academic insight. And he wrote a book, and the book is on the table. Can we look at the book? And then we'll look at Harvey. <laughs> It's Harvey's book. It's called Jefferson, the Army, and the Internet. That's why we have entitled this episode, Jefferson, the Army, and the Internet. Welcome to the show, Harvey. Thanks, Jay. It's, it's great to, to have here. you here. It's great to be able to examine a book like this. This is really a deep dive, if you will. This is a book of sweeping, sweeping, uh, you know, sea change in the American, the American story. Uh, and it's a, it's a matter of connecting huge um, foundational institutional things together to find the, the connection that actually defines the country. It's no small task. And you wrote this book in three places. You wrote this book, let's see, first place, um, it was Vietnam, or at least based on your Vietnam reporting experience. Back there, yes. And then you wrote it in Charlottesville, Virginia for a time. Yes. And then you wrote it here in Honolulu. Where I was raised and where we returned in time for my 60th high school reunion. <laughs> 60, okay. <laughs> Now, so you know, let's let's first, um, you know, sort of get a, a kind of a handle on this book. This is a very broad study of the American history, and you're into history, of course, uh, and the American dream, in a sense, yes. and the American future. No small task. But how did you come up with this idea, and what is the idea of the book? The idea kind of Jake crept up on me. It began, as you mentioned, when I was a correspondent in Vietnam in the 60s, and I became interested in an aspect of the Army uh, that other correspondents didn't pay a lot of attention to, which was logistics, uh, how, how the Army supplied itself, how it kept going 13,000 miles uh, away from its home base. And I wondered, uh, you know, what are these resources, these incredible, unique, from what I found, I'd been a reporter covering politics for several years, might be applied in, in the civilian community. And uh, this led me step by step into an inquiry that to me was full of surprises. I did not expect that the Army had so much background, so much history, in what you might call domestic nation building. And the book led me step by step through the history of the Army. Well, finally, I had to go back to the beginning. How did this all begin to pull it together and then carry it forward through uh, the settlement of the West? And then when the Army went overseas, but then I discovered it didn't leave that mission behind. It was doing things in the United States at the same time right up to today. And uh, when I came across what to me was rather astonishing perspectives, approaches on part of the Army that I believe has considerable uh, application in the civilian sector. Yeah. Well, so it's um, interesting that it's like Proust and um, the Petit <laughs> Madeleine in Remembrance yeah. of Things Past, That's where right. you look through the keyhole yeah. and then it, it, um, it trips your mind and expands it your growing, it growing, keeps growing and growing and you begin to see, you know, lots of things in great detail that you might not otherwise have seen. And it seems to me that you're looking through the keyhole from the Vietnam perspective, yes. through, through the keyhole of logistics. And because the Army is largely involved, largely dedicated to logistics, and they look back down the historical trail and examine the culture of the Army. What is the Army? It, it's probably the greatest Army in the world. Without uh, question. Without question. And, I mean, it's got great people. It's got great history, great achievements. And, um, you know, it's a it's great, great organization and great, of course, logistics. So it seems to me that when you look back down through the keyhole, you have to look at the formation of the army, and you did that, and you found that West Point was established, well you knew, I, mean, I didn't know, but West Point was established by Thomas Jefferson. Well I didn't know, actually, when I began, because, um, and I mentioned this in the book, in uh, 2002, the 200th anniversary, of uh, the founding of West Point, there was a conference held, a mini conference, a symposium at West Point called by a professor of history at West Point. 
for an interesting purpose. As, as, uh, as he put it, and I, I begin a chapter uh, in that point, uh, up until then, within, even in, among West Point faculty, uh, leaders of the Army, it was assumed that West Point was founded by Thomas Jefferson. The only problem with this was, as he pointed out in, in, in the opening uh, chapter of a book that came out, I suppose, that, uh, founded by George Washington, I think I should say, uh, Washington was dead. Who founded West Point? And it wasn't until 2002 that West Point realized that its founder was Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> even the institution itself. Even the institution itself, much <laughs> less the army and much less the rest of the public. Why was this? How did this happen? And then that, you know, sparks your career. Why? Well, part of the reason is Jeff people don't like to remember Jefferson as the founder of West Point uh, because he was not known as a military man. Washington makes a much better founder. Uh, many of the supporters of, of Jefferson don't like to think of him as the founder of West Point. And so there was kind of a, a, a what Solzhenitsyn called in, in another uh, context about the Soviet Union, a desire not to know <laughs> that this man founded West Point. And then the question became why? Because he had opposed the founding of West Point in the 1790s. There have been proposals by Washington and proposals by Hamilton for a military academy, and Jefferson rejected them out of hand. But he had something in mind, and you had to really dig down through his papers. He wanted an engineering school. You know, Jefferson, Hamilton was pointed across the Atlantic. He wanted a giant army and, you know, in the best European tradition. Jefferson saw this vast continent needed to be settled. Uh, we had a, some pioneers charging out across this continent, and you had no discipline. You had no infrastructure capability. You had nothing. The universities at the time, Harvard, you know, Yale, they taught classics and they taught theology. Uh, well, that wasn't going to do well, you much good. It wasn't helping you crossing the country, building a nation. Building a nation. So. He snuck in a bill for a military academy, which was in effect the establishment. It was the first university in the United States to offer a four-year degree in engineering, and was the only one for half a century. How does that compare against Europe? Were there engineering universities in Europe? There was one uh, in France which influenced Jefferson, the Ecole Polytechnique, yes. which trained engineers, but they had a choice of going into the army or into civilian life. I think we have to appreciate the connection between engineering and the army. Yes. Engineers would, would help an army, would enable, facilitate the moves of an army. Uh, it wasn't just, um, you know, building buildings. It was, it was logistics back again to that, no? It was logistics. It was roads. I mean, to get Thank across you. the continent. And in, in, uh, the capability, when you talked about an engineer in those days, were people who could build practical things. Jefferson called it useful knowledge. You know, how can you build a road? And they came up with this fast, <laughs> wonderful idea. How do you justify the military building roads? Well, they called them military roads. They connected the various strategic points, forts, yeah. cross country. But these were the first highways that were used. It was basically uh, for settlers. They provided the engineers for the railroads. There were no engine. There were no American trained engineers. They didn't exist. The engineers during the Revolutionary War were all mainly from Europe, mainly from France. Yeah. So interesting. Uh, and you know, it was visionary. 
for Jefferson to see this, visionary for him to understand that this was different than Europe because we had to look west. We were going to build a nation as kind of an early manifest destiny. That's we right. have to build this place, and in order to do it, we have to make strategical forts. We have mm -hmm. to we have to connect them with roads. And so, uh, what you have is the I'm not sure which way to put this, but the army is the wrapper for engineers or engineers are the wrapper for army, but they were inextricably intertwined at that oh, point. Oh, yes. And, and they went on in the 19th century also to have a profound influence, and here I, we can follow this all the way through this, on the civilian sector. Because uh, the first departments in science and engineering at Harvard, at Yale, at Michigan, were all run by faculty from West Point. <laughs> no kidding. Yes. <laughs> Trigonometry was introduced to the United States by way of West Point. Uh, so it was a, a truly revolutionary educational institution. Well, you know, you, you talk about how they had did theology and philosophy and whatnot. Yeah. Um, why, have, why had these other institutions failed to understand the value of engineering? Uh, why had they? Why did they have to wait for West Point to yeah. do engineering? They, why didn't they think of that earlier? Well, you know, uh, higher education in those days was dominated by a certain mindset. It was dominated by classics and theology, and and engineering was kind of looked down on. Yeah. Uh, Jefferson didn't see it that way. He called it quote useful knowledge yeah, and we yeah. need a little bit more in the United States yeah and 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 he he pushed it uh, uniquely among the people Hamilton didn't think that much he was mainly interested in the Academy to train soldiers for war Jefferson said wait a minute first we need to you know war with big European powers uh, and and Jefferson literally almost single-handedly turned the country westward. Well, it was a disruptive thought, wasn't it? I mean, he it's that vision very, of his, you know, you could put, put that in a list of a very few things to say these things made the country great. Yeah. It made us able to reach from shore to shore. It made us able to build a nation and an economy. And, and his idea, his vision was right in the center of that, wasn't it? Oh, very much so. And, and you know, it, it continues to this day, and it had, had an effect on the character of the Army also, because as you move across the continent, and as you have to supply this Army, you you're dealing with something much larger, you know, the supply lines in that from Paris to say Berlin, where the great wars were fought, were nothing compared to the supply lines that had to be constructed to settle a continent. Yeah. So, so you developed a certain mindset, a certain can-do, sort of we have to get from here to there yeah. and we have to keep supply and he ke also kept the army very small. It established a culture. So yeah, can you talk right. about how your book tracks on the 19th century, how your book tracks on the development of the army with this Jeffersonian concept? Well, it follows how the army uh, moved out, beginning in fact, I should mention, and again with Jefferson, with the Lewis and Clark expedition, yeah. which it was no coincidence, these were two army officers. Ah. It was run, the whole expedition, like an army encampment. They had court martials uh, during this. Uh, during their two year, I mean, because Jefferson saw you needed this discipline. He, they were sending back scientific specimens. They needed this training. And in those days, it, it was fascinating because apparently the White House was like a natural history museum. It was full of crates and boxes. Lewis and Clark had sit, sent back to Jefferson, <laughs> who's sitting here, he, you know, instead of wheeling and dealing, is going over all these uh, scientific specimens sh shipped him. So this character grew up in the Army as a kind of um, uh, entity. Uh, they built roads, the, the, weather, the National Weather Service, grew out of an order by the Surgeon General. One of the things about the Army is they had forts all over the country. So the Surgeon General was curious about climate. So he directed the surgeons, they called them in those days, they were physicians, in the various forts, uh, 
to keep records of the weather so he could uh, check it out for diseases, things like this. Out of this, over a period of decades, grew the National Weather Service and ultimately NOAA. So you can trace, if you trace the roots of NOAA back to its origins, uh, you will find uh, uh, army officers, surgeons on, in Fort Laramie, uh, the far west and so on, um, uh, recounting things. An another thing about it that, that was very distinctive for the United States, the army in those days was the province, the officer corps, of aristocrats. It was limited to people of higher standing. And it was that way in the United States until Jefferson. And then he changed the whole character. And when you notice today how cadets are chosen from different states, yeah. so many per state, that was a deliberate. Uh, that was Jeffersonian too. Very much so. And the idea was to spread out the officer. To democratize it. Yes. And it was a very deliberate policy. Uh, and what's fascinating, uh, at least to me, as, as someone coming at this uh, from a contemporary viewpoint, was how little I knew about this. And I had a doctorate in history, and I kept digging, and, and this wasn't in my history book, so That's I kept going. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it strikes me that when you, when you put this all together, the democratization of the Army, mm -hmm. uh, the science in the Army, science that the average community could not have or afford, science that the average uh, you know, citizen would, would not have access to, now all of a sudden the Army had specialists, who were willing to share their knowledge, their engineering expertise, their scientific, medical, environmental, all, all the things the Army does with the public. And, and they became a backbone of, of knowledge, uh, sharing it with, the, with the country. They, they were a resource. They dug wells. If, if they, the first, the Great Plains, which was considered a desert, until the Army dug some deep wells, and lo and behold, you know, they found water. Uh, the, uh, the pioneers going back and forth would stop at army forts for medical assistance free of charge, uh, you know, to hoof their, their horses for advice, for army officers wrote guidebooks on how to get across the country. There was a very close... Uh, you needed help, you went to the army. You went to the army and right. you didn't think about this it. This creates a great culture and yeah. uh, arguably the backbone of a great nation. Yeah. Uh, let's take a short break. Harvey Morrison, uh, journalist and historian and author of Jefferson, the Army and the Internet. And when we come back, we want to get to the point about the Internet and a kind of the world view that appears in the last part of the book, the last third of the book, I think. Um, where Harvey is making some important conclusions and suggestions for our country going forward. We'll be right back. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Okay, here's the book uh, that Harvey Morrison, our guest, wrote uh, Je over three separate venues and probably many years. Jefferson, the Army, and the Internet. It's a, it's a, it's a life project for you, isn't it? it, it in many ways it was. Yeah. I, I've been working on it since my retirement full time, and it took about 12 years. Yeah, wonderful, but then you can really think it through that way. Yeah. And so, I mean, that, and you sort of you connect it up. And I want to connect up now um, where we get to the internet, because the title of the book is Connecting Jefferson, back yeah. in the uh, 18th century, to the army through the 19th century and beyond, and now the internet. 
why did you go that far? How did you go that far? What is it well, that you connected? Yeah. I didn't have that in mind when I began. First, let me say that. It came as a, a complete surprise. It, I, I was following the Army, curious how far it went, whether it continued, how this evolved, all the way up to the present. And it, where I saw things going on that startled me and that I could mention. But the real turning point occurred uh, when I got into the subject of energy and, uh, and came across uh, a quote uh, that led me uh, into a lot of unexpected territory by the commander of the 1st Marine Division in Iraq uh, during the war, a, a general by the name of James Mattis who is now better known uh, in a higher position in government. Mattis cables back to Washington, D.C., release me from the tether of fuel. What was his problem? Well, units in Iraq relied on, on you know, depended on supply convoys. Eighty percent of the contents of these supply convoys was fuel. Troops had to be diverted to protect the supply convoys. They were taking casualties. You read about IEDs and things like that, which were mainly uh, hitting supply convoys. And Mattis is saying something's wrong here. He, he's asking the Pentagon, what can we do about reducing this dependence? So the Pentagon convenes. Uh, an entity called the Defense Science Board, uh, high-ranking former officials at the time was chaired by James Schlesinger, who was a former Secretary uh, of, uh, of Energy uh, and of Defense. Uh, and um, they came up with a couple of proposals. First, looking overseas, they said, we've got to make our bases more independent. And the military launched a crash renewable energy program. I'm not used to reading about the military launching renewable energy programs. But was it even more interesting was their recommendation uh, for the continental United States. They were very concerned about the security of the military units in the continental United States. Why? because they were dependent on a vulnerable electric grid. And so the Defense Department launched a campaign. They opened a new office. It was called the Operational Energy Office. And in the military, the key word, if you put operational in front of it, this means that... High priority. High priority. We want action. And a huge program has been launched within... You may notice here in Hawaii a lot of... Uh, uh, solar uh, panels are being used on military bases. So this is a part, and this is a byproduct of Iraq and Afghanistan, and of um, and of a sense of the army coming at energy from a national security perspective. Not because of climate change, not because of global warming, but because. We have to be operational, and if we lose contact with the grid, uh, we can't do anything. That led to, well, uh, let me look the inquiring reporter and historian. Uh, what, what makes the grid so vulnerable? Well, what makes it so vulnerable is the internet. Because uh, in the last 15 or 20 years, the electric grid uh, is been made, has been automated nationally. And as something like an equivalent, but much larger, of, of the Bank of America, it's automated. And therefore, it's vulnerable to cyber attack. And the military was very concerned about this ahead of, ahead of everyone else. Uh, and has launched a campaign in the Army. It's called Net Zero. Their objective is to get every Army base completely energy self-sufficient mm -hmm. and completely 
off the grid. Uh, off the grid and recycling its own water uh, and, and its waste. They're doing it? Yes. Uh, it's called Net Zero. There are about 15 sort of pilot bases that they, they began with. And they meet regularly, and they're meeting their goals. I follow, I follow it with, with increasing fascination. The Congress got very startled by this. The Navy took this up. And of course, you can't do solar in the Navy, so they went into biofuels. And at RIMPAC in 2012, right off of, of Hawaii. Five years ago. Yes. Uh, Ray Mabus, the uh, secretary in the Navy, tested out what he called the Great Green Fleet, uh, which was a carrier strike group running entirely on biofuels. Uh, this led to enormous anxiety back in Congress, which they weren't used to thinking of renewable energy in the Armed Services Committee uh, and the military. And you had some fascinating hearings where Mabus is being taken down by uh, Senator Inhofe and even Senator McCain. Why are you going into the energy business? Senator, this is necessary for national security. I, I'm, I'm sorry, we have to. So I saw this. How does this, this phenomenon, yes. uh, it's, a, you know, it's a moment in the evolution, if you will, of, yeah. of the development of the army, the military in general, but how does it connect back to what we were talking about before, this, this culture point that was uh, created in the creation of West Point and perpetuated at least you know, well, for 200 years after? Um, how does that connect with this? How does it extension, expression of what you were talking about? It, well, it, the expression came in, 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 actually, I have to go back to one previous example, uh, which, which led me, in any case. Uh, the military had an approach to renewable energy, uh, seeing it as a, th as a threat, as a national security issue. Uh, that grew out of its, its perspective of protecting the nation, not just uh, uh, by projecting power overseas, but by looking at threats directly in front of itself. And by bringing that, that mindset in, into its perception of these. But then beyond that, um, well, I have to take probably the best example which was a model from my We only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, well, the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, was run by the Army, uh, although hardly anyone knows it. Uh, Jefferson couldn't. It was a very important piece for the country in those days, in the middle 30s. Well, the, uh, and Roosevelt organized, called on the Army, because the civilian agents couldn't do it, to uh, build 1,300 camps, staffed them with 250,000 people in 60 days. It was the largest peacetime mobilization in American history. This is an amazing, amazing event. And what it led me to that and, and the outlook today was to think about how the Army might be used or might contribute mm -hmm. to doing for the country what it's doing for all its military bases. So that's bases. built in, into its DNA somehow. Oh, very much so. The early days that you spoke about. But uh, we only have a minute left. But, you know, this takes you to a suggestion, um, a sort of uh, uh, wrapping all these things together, sy synergizing all that has happened and all that you've read and studied and written about um, for the future of the country. Can you articulate that for us? Yeah. We need, and the Army saw this in its bases, what the country needs is to decentralize. We're too decentralized. The difference between an, cities are too big from a national security perspective. The difference between an earthquake in Los Angeles in 1900 and 2000 is 10 million people. The Army sees this, and they want to decentralize their operations. They want to get off the grid. And the book includes with a proposal for a national campaign toward decentralization, toward decentralizing the economy, uh, making it more vibrant, with a little help from the Army. Yeah, and it's an expression of Jefferson's
uh, I creation. I think Jefferson of, would love it. <laughs> I'm sure he would, from 1802 till now. I always ask authors who come on the show to read a paragraph they feel can give mm. us uh, the flavor of the book, and I wonder if you can do that, Harvey. Well, I can take the graph from uh, from the chapter entitled uh, on West Point. I, I quote it from it, but I, I'll read it from it anyway. Uh, in November 2001, a group of prominent American historians gathered at the United States Military Academy to commemorate the Academy's 200th anniversary by setting an important part of its history right. It seemed that the widespread belief that George Washington founded that hallowed institution didn't stand up. For a simple yet long overlooked reason neatly summarized by West Point history professor Robert McDonald, who convened the 2001 gathering. Quote from McDonald, no one thought to mention that when West Point was founded, Washington was dead. <laughs> An important point in the history in those critical, critical America's forgotten days. military history. Yeah. yeah. Well, Harvey, uh, just one other question and we'll have to close, and that is, if you had to you know, state a message, a takeaway that you would like people to get from this book, um, the, how you would want it to influence them, what would that be? Yeah, I think in the largest sense, I would say, that, and what I learned myself, because I, I suffered from it, there is too much compartmentalization between the military and civilian worlds. And they really need to get to know each other better to understand each other, and even to work together a little more. Yeah. And if I can, if I can have contributed uh, to that, and I'll be happy. That's great, Harvey. They are us. They are us. We are them. We are yes. all together in this. Exactly. Thank you so much, Harvey Myers, an author, journalist, and uh, the writer of Jefferson, uh, the Army, and the Internet. Aloha. Aloha, dear. Bro.